second industrial revolution. So we'll talk about the uh, differences between the first and second, and then uh, its impact, and then society, and that's about it. So, uh, oh, and critics of capitalism too, but not Marxism yet. So, um, second industrial revolution, it's gonna focus on um, Germany, mostly. Um, but give me some characteristics of that, uh, of the second industrial revolution. So it's about 71 to 1914 ish. They focus on developments and stuff like chemicals. So Germany, it's also the US too, but this is European history, but for world, remember US too? Say it again? Chemicals. Like what? Uh, bleaches and acid and stuff. Yeah, sulfuric acid, nice. I don't know the chemistry behind it, but it's somehow an, an easy agent to get and use um, for various industrial processes, but I, I don't know the chemistry behind it. Um, bleaches, yeah. So bleaches, uh, sulfuric acid, oops, acid. Uh, what else we got? Um, harnessing electricity. Yeah, give me, give me two though. Because I made her give me two. I got, all right, now you looked. Uh, investment process and investing in railroads. Okay. Well, they already did the railroads part, but you're right. Uh, that's attached to the best word thing. Give me another one besides the investing in railroads. Uh, he, he already said one if you were listening. I was trying, yeah, I was trying to remember what he said. <laughs> Oh, electricity. Yeah, you gotta whisper to you. I ain't counting that. All right. <laughs> Bessemer process, electricity. Anybody else got two more? Uh, two. Uh, yeah, we can do two more. Oh, I was gonna say gas, but I don't know second one. Gas? What do you mean gas? Petroleum gas. Petroleum. Okay, cool. Refined oil. All right, fair enough. Soaps and like stuff for your hygiene. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. I'll take that. Soaps. Um, what was the other one you said? Petroleum. Yeah. Petroleum, there we go. Petroleum. Uh, here we go. So I'll go back uh, to see if you, yeah? The writing's not on the frame. It's not on the frame? How hard it is. Oh, let me fix that. Now it is, even though you can barely read it anyway. All right, thank you. All right, um, okay. So those are five factors. I'll give you and you a chance to get it because I was asking for two. What was it previously in the first industrial revolution for the focus of her power? Um, steam engines. Yep, coal, right, cool, cool. All right, and then um, what was another hygienic or bacterial focused discovery in the first industrial revolution around that time anyway? Something that promoted people not dying by preventing death by bacteria. Okay, what you got? Vaccines, I forgot what they're called. <laughs> yeah, but which one? I think it's for what? Yeah, give me a specific vaccine. It's uh, not even a vaccine, it's an inoculation. Yeah. But vaccines um, like here's the antibodies or dead virus. Um <laughs> Oh my gosh. What? Smallpox. There, I could say, yeah, smallpox. <laughs> well done. Okay, cool. Uh, those are actually first one I wanted to give you a chance for uh, uh, getting them. All right, hold on. Let me catch up on this. All right. Um, all right, so these are some characteristics of the second industrial revolution. Uh, what about, we got the electricity. What about, we already have the factory system. We already have mechanization, but what's different about mechanization in this second industrial revolution, if you know. They have larger complex machines. Yeah, what does that do? They cut out even more human workers and it speeds up uh, the process of making something. Yeah, so they can do uh, bigger projects. Um, they uh, can utilize more power of electricity and also they can use less human labor so they're more efficient. So we also have mechanization, not that it didn't exist before, but this is enhanced mechanization. Um, Bigger machinery, using electric power to boost it, uh, using various chemicals to make these machines work in different ways or more efficiently or less corrosively. Uh, mechanization improved. And of course, is going to uh, 
improve the amount of production that they can do. So larger things can be produced more quickly, more efficiently, with less human labor, so it's cheaper. Uh, so that mechanization improvement is going to be rather key. Okay, cool. Um, how about this Bessemer process? What does that actually do? Um, yeah, tell me its impact. So you, how it works and its impact, if you can, for both. Go. It um, makes uh, higher quality, cheaper iron. Like, how? <clears throat> what does that mean? Like the prevention method makes like uh, the iron more more of a better quality, but also like reduces the cost to manufacture. Right? Okay, cool. So it's a better quality, possibly, but certainly I can make it more cheaply. But uh, why? What you got? No? What you got? It's because of the way they do it. They they do it where it's like a Crucible, what? Not a crucible, I forgot. The way they make it, it's like a certain shape, and then there's, um, oh my god, I just forgot the process. <laughs> it's okay, I'll tell you. So, uh, they basically have basically these giant vats, which are like big, big jars, uh, and they put a bunch of pig iron in, which is like the raw iron ore, I guess, or at least a reduced version of it. Uh, and they melt it, and they found that just by adding oxygen, it, it, it removes the carbon, or adds it. Removes carbon, I think. Might be adds it. I forget exactly if it's remove or add. But it probably removes because it's just oxygen, O2. But anyways, carbon so they melt it. Harder. What was that? Carbon makes the, makes the metal harder. Right, but I can't remember why, if it's just, I don't think that, that think steel actually, is necessarily harder than steel, iron. It's just less, um, it's less brittle. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? It, it, it was to make steel, and steel requires carbon right. to be added, to be harder. Okay, so that would make, that would answer that one, if you're sure on that one. That's what I forget, if, if it was the case. Okay, cool. So, <laughs> thanks for jogging the memory on that. All right, cool. So, uh, by adding the air, uh, it's able to add the carbon to it, uh, which is going to make it steel. And I know steel is, is better, not only because, I'm not sure if it's harder per se, but I know it's more, uh, it's less brittle, and that was important. So steel can uh, be bent or take more uh, of, a, of a beating without breaking, essentially. Um, that's why it's a, re a large reason why it's better. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so the air comes in and that uh, aids this process by uh, adding the carbon and, and somehow allowing it to uh, uh, stratify and they can collect the uh, much more purified version of it to create steel. Uh, and they can do it large scale too uh, because of their improved machinery and this uh, cheapened process. It used to be a long process uh, for a small amount. Now it was a relatively uh, quicker, cheaper process for large amounts. So what impact does that have on um, the various projects going on? So you mentioned it lowered cost production, yes, but what, what are some things that are going to flourish because of this new process? Transportation. How? And, uh, it makes a production of things such as steel ships easier. Okay, cool. Uh, besides steel ships, what else? Uh, trains. Yeah, exactly. So the uh, automobile, not automobiles, uh, the trains and the tracks in particular. So that's going to allow uh, improved uh, railroad expansion, steel ships, and there's one more you guys are missing that becomes really, really popular at the end of the 19th or in the beginning of the 20th century. Super popular. Automobiles. Good guess, but that's not what I'm going for. Those aren't mass produced in the 20s. Airplane. Good guess. All right, I'll give you this hint. If I go to Europe, for example, if I go to the big cities, um, do they look like big cities in the United States? Um, they have skyscrapers. Skyscrapers, yes. So uh, it's not that Europe doesn't have skyscrapers, but they have less. Because many of the buildings that they built before, they didn't have this uh, easy steel making process. And you need those steel beams in the concrete to actually build these skyscrapers. Otherwise, they'll break on themselves. Um, so any cities and buildings built after uh, this process is sort of mastered uh, by the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, those are able to be built vertically. So we have more vertical cities. So if you go to Europe, uh, a lot of the cities are more horizontal. Like they're big, but they're like kind of more flat and then they're uh, wider generally. Whereas like New York, San Francisco, it's a relatively small surface area, but it, you have a vertical city. Uh, and that's because of the uh, uh, easy making, much more available steel um, in this, as, as a result of this process. So yeah, uh, skyscrapers. 
in vertical cities. All right, cool. So that's what the Bessemer process does. So we're gonna have a lot more railroads, a lot more uh, steel ships, and we're gonna have vertical cities now for the first time. Okay, cool. Um, what else is here? How does electricity help out? Well, what does it help out, by the way? Electricity, What's it, what benefit does electricity bring as opposed to coal or water power? It gives uh, faster and more efficient power for the it does. So I've got more power, it's more efficient, but also I can stretch the power out. So for example, we're all using power right now. Do we have like a generator here on campus making the power? No, where is it coming from? Power lines. Yeah, power lines, which come, come from some power plant, wherever they might be, whether it's a dam or a nuclear thing or a coal burning factory, whatever it is. Uh, it can travel large distances and provide me with the power um, in a network. I don't have to have like a steam engine here that's moving a turbine which is creating things for us. Uh, I can harness the power from other locations. So that's a big one. Uh, so electricity is going to uh, allow uh, quicker, more accessible uh, energy source, or just energy. Right, so that can power my lights and my factory machinery and I don't have to have like a steam engine on site to do it. Uh, we're not gonna have like electric trains or anything like that for a long time. So those are still gonna be uh, coal and petroleum and they still are for the most part. You have some electric trains and you know, Tesla and some electric cars, but uh, as of right now, it's better if your vehicle is independent to be run on um, non-electric uh, sources, uh, but they could be. But buildings and stuff are generally run by electric sources. Whether that electricity is generated by fossil fuels or not, you know, is, is, is an issue. But uh, this is a much better way to get power uh, and longer distances and networks, okay? And also, it doesn't just give me power. What else does this electricity allow me to do that's a, a major innovation of its time that greatly increases the efficiency of economies and politics and society and human life? Telegraph? Yeah, telecommunications, right. This allows me, well, once I you know, lay the power lines and all that uh, through copper wire and all that, that is going to allow me to uh, benefit from telecommunications, which were also invented at that time, and then used. So at first, it's the telegraph that's using Morse code. Did I tell you Morse code worked before? Nope. It's just a bunch of, it's a series of, of, of essential taps and delays between the taps. Uh, so you have to like, yeah, exactly. That's what it's like, but you know, those aren't words, I'm sure. Uh, but anyways, uh, so uh, that's how they would communicate. So is it archaic? Yeah, but it was possible for the first time with Morse code, Samuel Morse, the inventor, uh, to actually communicate across country uh, or across the ocean when they laid those um, international transoceanic power lines down, which they did. Um, so that allows you to communicate instantly for the first time. So we have the first conflicts that are actually coordinated with uh, telegraphs. Uh, in Morse code and then eventually telephones. So that's gonna drastically improve how efficient and communicative uh, people are. So that helps economies, that helps governments, that helps militaries uh, because they can instantly communicate across the world. So first, again, we have telegraphs and Morse code, which is, a, you have to learn that language. But then when we get phones, it doesn't matter. Then you can just talk uh, on it. So, and then telephones later. Also too, uh, tied in this electricity, this is a major one. We have electric lighting and heating. Well, eventually heating. For now, it's the lighting. That's a big one. Because now, what can factories do with lighting? Work at night. Work at night, right? Or just, you know, not have to have a bunch of glass windows uh, to prov provide sunlight. Also, now, I can potentially have those lightings go down into mines and places like that that were, uh, it was often difficult to, uh, to engage in. I remember now, sulfuric acid, I think, is a, uh, uh, a, an integral part of batteries, I believe. So, uh, yes, thank you. And that's, uh, that's, what, uh, that's another important role that they play. Okay, what else do I want to mention? Oh, why do we care about the soap thing? Because the Aztecs kind of accidentally discovered it before when they killed so many people that the uh, human fats then dissolved into the water and became bleaches and they kind of found out soap. Um, but why, why do we care about the soap thing? What, what did we really find out? Yeah, well, it could stop any bacteria, but yeah, certainly the bad bacteria. Okay, cool. So not only did they discover that soap works and how to produce it, but they also discovered why it works, because there are little microorganisms that actually infect you and damage your cells and make you sick and, and uh, uh, 
kill you, essentially. Oh, I shouldn't say they make you sick, by the way. You actually make yourself sick. Um, your immune system is trying to get the, the, the pathogen out. That's why you experience the, the swelling and the pain uh, and the, the runny nose and, and all of that stuff. Nonetheless, <clears throat> uh, uh, it's trying to prevent you from dying. If you didn't have that, you would die. Uh, because it would go in and infect your cells and destroy your cells and eventually enough of your cells and a vital organ would be destroyed then the organ wouldn't work then you die um, that's essentially what happens so yes we uh, soaps it's not just that we learn that it does something but we learn why uh, it, it actually saves lives as we find out about bacteria and later viruses and I believe somebody actually theorized DNA in atoms uh, in the 19th century way before we could see any of that which is pretty cool um, I mean, there have been people that uh, assumed that there were smaller particles going back all the way to the Greeks, but they actually had a solid theory for, I think, atoms and, um, uh, and DNA in the 19th century, way before they could even see it. Okay, so those are some major advances, and we forgot one that's attached to this petroleum thing. So why is petroleum better, and what are we able to put it in that makes it better? You were first. You're able to create an internal combustion engine. Yes, so what's that? The, so it's basically you put oil in it, petroleum in it, yeah. and then there's air, and then a spark lights up the oil and pushes the piston. Yeah, the explosion does, correct. And that they attach that mechanically to the drive shaft, which spins wheels or whatever it is that you're trying to spin or create. Uh, they can do the same thing for generating electricity, because that's essentially uh, spinning a magnet around a copper coil, and that's actually how they generate electricity. Uh, so whether it's moving a vehicle or generating electricity, they uh, design that internal combustion engine, right? So there's a space there, they put the fuel in, they combust it, the explosion happens, it moves a piston, uh, and then when the explosion dissipates, the piston come back, comes back in and they attach that to some sort of gear uh, and drive shaft that can move vehicles or generate power or whatever. All right, cool, that's a major one. And that, of course, is gonna be attached to several new inventions like the automobile and later on the plane. Excellent, but those aren't gonna be very effective till World War II, uh, but they will have them. Okay, all right, that's, the, uh, that's largely this second industrial revolution all the details about it. Yeah, that's a good enough amount there. So that's all late 19th, early 20th century stuff before World War I. Um, Germany's gonna get a huge advantage here. And um, before Germany's even Germany, and it's still Prussia as the strongest German state and a bunch of other little German states that work along with it, um, they're gonna be involved in a conflict with a major European power and they're gonna have a massive advantage. So who is that power, what is the war, and what was their advantage? Uh, when they went to war with France, it was called the Franco-Prussian War. Exactly. Prussia had more, like, and Germany had more railway like, set up, so they, had, they could transport troops and like, supplies more efficient. Exactly, so yes. Because they already had some coordination among those states, like with the Zulfarine, so they'd already been in contact with each other, had essentially a free tariff zone, laid those railroads, they had a massive advantage in moving troops, and um, uh, supplies and uh, out communicating the French and they were able to outmaneuver them and overwhelm them. And they won in just a few weeks. It was less than six months. I can't remember exactly the time. Uh, but they quickly won. So the Germans uh, quickly overwhelm uh, the French in this conflict. And then they, uh, they're, they're so happy about their success, at that point they're gonna declare their, their unification and form the German Empire. Uh, which we now know as Germany. Uh, Over one French, 1871, uh, unify. German states into uh, the German Empire. Um, I don't think it's in the notes, but you probably can guess. Whose king do they allow to become emperor of the German people and whose economy, military, bureaucracy do they largely make the uh, system for all of the German Empire. Oh, Bismarck? Yeah, Bismarck, uh, he's an advisor to uh, uh, Wilhelm, who becomes the Kaiser or Emperor. Right, so they largely borrow uh, Bismarck's and Prussia's uh, systems, whether it's militaristic, economic, uh, or political, or bureaucratic. Not that they do it entirely, but it's mostly gonna be their systems because they were, at the time, the pinnacle of German states. Okay, so that's that conflict, and that's how these factors gave uh, uh, an advantage to the Germans, and that's going to uh, be a, what's the word I'm looking for? 
Uh, it's going to give the British a scare. Why would it give the British a scare? Seeing Germany go in and just flatten uh, France so quickly and so devastatingly. Yeah, they have some actual legitimate competition for the world power. It hadn't previously been France historically uh, with the British. But now we're going to see these two countries that have been enemies since going all the way back to the at least the Hundred Years' War, which we don't even talk about in this class. It's basically when the English invaded France before France was France. They have animosity going back hundreds of years. This is the point where they switch, essentially. Not that they're best buddies, but they're no longer like arch rivals and enemies. They now see a common rising threat as, as Germany. Uh, so we're gonna start seeing after this conflict, uh, France and Britain more so working together than against each other for the first time. They're still gonna try to you know, claim a bunch of territory for themselves, but they both see the biggest threat uh, to their empires as Germany, not each other anymore. Okay, cool, and yeah, that's good for the, uh, Second Industrial Revolution. Now let's talk a little bit about some problems that arise uh, in the 19th century having to do with uh, economics. Any questions about the Second Industrial Revolution? Yeah. On the side, you put peaches with soap. What? On the side, you put peaches with soap. Peaches? Oh, it's supposed to be bleaches. Bleaches? Yeah. That must have been a typo. <laughs> peaches and soap. That's what really, that's what, uh, that's how people were dying. Yeah, it's supposed to be bleaches. Yeah, I think I told you guys how they, um, the British used to think tea purified the water uh, and, and made them not sick, but it turns out it's just that boiling the water killed the bacteria, so that's why they weren't getting sick anymore. Uh, they figure things like that out now. All right, um, so what I want to talk about now is uh, what, what type of, what's the dominant economic practice in Europe in the 19th century? Be specific, too. Don't just say capitalism. Like, what does that mean? Free market government there we go cool so laissez-faire uh, free market economics so in the 19th century we're going to start to see some of the problems so we've only talked about like the benefits so far the things that made an improvement from the old feudal agricultural economies and there were a lot right people doing what they want people being able to uh, benefit from their own labor and ideas uh, government protections of their ideas and property so that of course is going to incentivize people to go out and do things uh, create things, uh, provide for the uh, needs of others, and oh no, what if the prices get too high? Well, competition dictates that I can't drive the price too high because then I'm just going to run out of business. So, those are all great, <clears throat> and they're great fundamentals, but in the 19th century we start seeing some of the uh, imperfections of a no uh, government involvement uh, uh, system, a laissez-faire system. Give me one of them. The Act of 1873 where Austria's economy crashed that affected many nations that they were trading with or had. That's true, but why is why did they blame free market economics? Because free market is not let, is most of the time, it can not be run by logic and by emotion, causing uh, fear and that drives the economy down. Okay, yeah, uh, that's one major issue with free market economics when there's no government intervention whatsoever is you are uh, vulnerable to the emotional spending or not spending habits of, of, uh, of the population, essentially. So if something bad happens and everybody goes to rush to the bank to get their money out, what's going to happen? Banks are going to go under, right? Those, are the, those were the panics. And like, we get a big one, obviously, in the 30s, 20, 1929 to the to 1930s, the Great Depression. But before that even happened, you routinely had these things called panics. Uh, and panics were, again, largely uh, something happened that caused people to be afraid whether it was a minor stock market issue or a bank went under for whatever reason, people were afraid that their money would be lost. They would immediately go and rush to take all the gold and silver and money they had in it. And of course, we already know this, there doesn't even exist enough money in banks to give everybody their money. Uh, so that can cause major issues. So the, you have a banking system failure, people can't get loans as easily, uh, there's not getting as much business, and they have to lay people off, it starts this nasty cycle. So panics, like the panic of 1873, uh, showed the uh, weakness of uh, laissez-faire down cycles. And again, a, a, a panic is when there's a run on banks. Something happens, people are afraid, they panic, they go to the bank, pull their stuff out, bank goes under, it starts this nasty uh, sequence of events where people lose money, uh, lose jobs, 
and they end up with this large, what you would call like a recession or, or, or a, a depression where there's unemployment, it's hard to find jobs and, and all of that. And you mentioned a specific one, 73, and that was of course started by Austrian banking system one under, and that affected every economy that was trading or engaging uh, with the Austrians. They all got afraid. Oh no, this Austrian company went over. I better pull all my stock out. Oh, that means I gotta go to the bank and, and uh, because they might go under from the stocks being pulled out, I gotta pull my money out of those banks. And it caused this European wide recession uh, for 10 years. So some people started saying, maybe this interconnectedness of all of our economies isn't the best because if one stupid country screws up, not even a stupid country, some idiot in that country screws up, we all go down with them. All right, so what is the alternative then to this problem where they start criticizing free trade because of these down cycles? Because again, if I'm attached to a country, they screw up, they have a collapse, I'm attached to it, it's going to follow and hit my country as well. Protectionism? Yeah, what's that? It's basically where uh, countries now start like, reintroducing like, tariffs to certain products to like, protect their own industries. Yes, okay, so we have... Uh, in the 1870s, all the way till about the 1920s, we have a, a, a resurgence of what's called protectionism. So uh, that is where you use tariffs to protect domestic industries. What's a domestic industry? Shout it out. Industry in the yeah, it's in your own nation, right? So a domestic for us would be something to do with the United States. Something happens in China, not domestic for us. It's domestic though for the Chinese because that's, that's their country. For us, it's international, like that's somebody else. But if you're China and something happens, then it's domestic uh, if it's your economy. Okay, so they don't want you trading or engaging in business with other people as much. They want you to protect the domestic industry. And that way, when they screw up, like in Austria in 1873, you aren't as likely to get hit by this wave of unemployment and panic. Okay, fair enough. Um, it's not the same thing, though, as mercantilism. Mercantilism was like, put tariffs on everything. We don't want you buying anything from other countries, only buy our stuff. It's a little different. So who comes up with this idea that says, no, don't go all in on the tariffs. Just use it here and there for select industries uh, to keep capitalism going, the benefits, but try to negate these massive panics. Yes, Friedrich Liszt of uh, Germany. Uh, he comes up with this idea, essentially, that's called the national system. So it's not mercantilism. Don't confuse it. Don't be like, all right, tariffs on everything. Don't buy anything from any other country. That's not it. But it is saying we should have some tariffs so we're not completely dependent on other countries uh, for everything. Because when they screw up, we end up suffering too. So it's... Uh, select tariffs to protect uh, certain industries, but only partial intervention. They still wanted to protect uh, market economies because that, that still is, and it still is today, by the way, the, the most effective uh, way to produce things and provide for people's needs protect uh, market economy. All right, fair enough. Uh, and that becomes a popular practice in the 1870s. Uh, in fact, Germany is the first to start reinitiating these uh, uh, tariffs and reducing free trade to protect people in its own market. So uh, who does it and what's it called? This mark with the trade tariff agreement of 1879 where he taxes foreign grains. Yep, exactly. He wanted to protect his Prussian grain uh, market. So uh, one of the first major tariffs we put into place or put back into place is uh, the tariff agreement of 1879. And that's Germany. And that's a, a, a tariff on grains, foreign grains. And again, remind me why he's doing this? Why would he put a tariff on grains? What's the point of it? What's the purpose? Because uh, like German like, grain industry was uh, getting like out of business, so he wanted to protect it. Exactly. Russian and U.S. grain at the time was uh, uh, too, too competitive, especially Russians because they're right there. Uh, so he's going to reinstall, uh, or not reinstall, but he's going to install this uh, tariff agreement uh, that's going to put the, the tariff on the grain, so now people are more likely to buy uh, German uh, grains. 
All right, but we know that it's not that simple because now it's more expensive to buy grain, so you increase the cost uh, of pr these prices, you cause inflation, and it, it's a bad cycle. Uh, but again, they're very afraid of these panics, like you know, resonating and affecting all economies. And it's gonna happen again uh, with the Great Depression on a very, very large global scale, actually. Okay, um, let's go over a couple more problems in critics, and then we'll take our break after that. Uh, what is the other major problem with this laissez-faire approach, we have no intervention whatsoever. Um, there can be monopolies, which are industry, which are industries that um, can um, have complete control over a part of the economy. Yeah. Okay. Why? Why are they? Uh, why are monopolies a problem? Okay. So first of all, let me get that problem number two. Uh, monopolies. Okay, and that's when uh, one business or they, they can also be called trusts or cartels when uh, it's not just you, but you're working with another business to both act as like a monopoly. So it'd be like uh, McDonald's, let's pretend it's only McDonald's and Burger King. Like McDonald's and Burger King working together, they both jack their prices up. So it's like, now I can't just be like, oh, McDonald's jacked his price up, I'll just go to Burger King. I can't because they both jack their prices up because they work together. All right, so one business or a cartel, which is a group of businesses, uh, control an industry or region. Okay, uh, and why is that a problem specifically? Oh, I gotta give you the money for that before I forget. Why is that a problem? There's no competitors to actually determine the prices. So? So it um, sucks for the people that actually uh, spend money in these uh, companies or they can't afford some of these Okay, yeah, they can jack the prices up. What about quality? Um, the quality can get worse because they, uh, they're selling a lot, so. Yeah, they don't have to make their product better because you can't buy anything else anyway. Right, so they can jack the prices up because that's your only choice. They don't have to make it better quality because that's your only choice. And uh, they don't have to innovate either because you have no alternatives. They don't have to make their product better because you have to buy their product anyway. In fact, they usually prevent innovation. Like, uh, for example, um, what the hell's his name? Rockefeller, Standard Oil. He tried to snub electricity um, because he didn't want electricity replacing uh, his uh, oil business because basically back then they had to buy like kerosene lamps and things like that. So he hated electric lighting. So he tried his best to just uh, destroy uh, people like Tesla and Edison and, and, and them trying to, you know, expand electricity. Uh, so yeah, you have, uh, it destroys the fundamentals of the free market. So you have no competition. And what does that mean? That means you have, uh, no, uh, no price mechanisms, so they can jack the price up. No quality control, because again, you have no choice. And you have uh, no innovation, because they don't have any reason to innovate. In fact, they try to stop others from innovating, because that threatens their, their uh, monopolistic hold on everybody. All right, so yeah, and by the way, monopolies can act in several ways. They could buy you out. Uh, they could, uh, in the past, they could steal your idea, and you're like, wait a second, I thought you had patents. They do. But they know you can't afford a lawyer, so they would just intentionally steal your stuff, make you go to court that you couldn't afford, or you'd have a worse lawyer, so you'd lose anyway, and then they get to take your product. Um, now it, they have more mechanisms against that, um, so you can't, what is it exactly? Basically, if you lose the case, you have to pay for it, so now they can't just run you out of money if you're poor by making you go to court. Uh, if they lose the case, then they have to pay for it. Uh, but anyways, so uh, uh, these are ways that it was violating the market uh, policies and fundamentals and uh, they needed to get rid of it. And nobody can get rid of this, by the way, if a company does this. The only one that can stop this is who? The government, right. So uh, we don't have any intervention yet. That's a 20th century thing when we have like, in the United States we have trust bus laws that uh, disallow uh, monopolistic control or cartels. Uh, they break them up uh, or they'll, they'll, they'll penalize people. But um, what's an example of, in Europe, I already give you Standard Oil as an American example, the rock boat. What's an example of a monopoly in, uh, in Europe? The Krupp family in Germany dominating the weapons industry. Yeah, the Krupp family. They basically made all of the primary weapons uh, for Europe from uh, the Thirty Years' War, so like the 1640s, all the way till World War II and just after the 1950s. So they dominated uh, the weapons producing uh, industry. They weren't the only ones, but they were definitely the most dominant, uh, and they largely armed uh, both sides of wars in many conflicts, stretching from the Thirty Years' War all the way to World War II. So uh, they get some 
some criticism from, from others. There's one that's not on the notes that I do want to mention, and this is a big one. And it's kind of related to that middle class issue where the working class can't get changes because the middle class just makes all the laws against the working class. This is called cronyism. So add this if you haven't. And this is a quick explanation. Cronyism. Anybody know what cronyism is? You guys do. Maybe I've mentioned it before. Uh, you have an answer to make today. Yeah, okay, so this is when business and politicians uh, collude. Collude means uh, corruptively use money and bribes, essentially. So uh, if I'm a business and I know there's a lot of oil in a national park, for example, uh, I could potentially purchase the land or lease it from the government. When that happens, it's supposed to be a public auction. Like all companies hear about it and they can all place their bid. But wouldn't it be better if I could just pay a politician to lease it to me without an auction and I just get to buy, buy the uh, property for cheap and get all the oil? Is that a possibility? Yes. Yeah. It is, right? Why would the politician say yes to that? Yeah, because you're going to pay them. They're not going to get the money otherwise. So you could bribe politicians to give you super cheap or free land, uh, uh, private leases that are supposed to be made public and auctioned for. Uh, you could get tax breaks. They could look the other way on you uh, uh, violating some sort of regulation that would cost you more money. Uh, all of these things. Uh, again, it's uh, big business, not even big business, but we'll put big business. Big business uh, uh, plus politicians. And again, some of the bonuses could be through bri bribery, uh, tax breaks, uh, cheap or free land, and leases on the land, which is where you like rent it for a time to extract resources or whatever. Uh, or potentially, um, I don't want to say turning your head, ignoring, ignoring regulation. So they would send you the inspector who inspected your factory and found that it was uh, clean and safe and all that stuff, even though it's not. All right, and they would, uh, they would just get, the politicians get the money, so they benefit if they're not caught, otherwise they go to jail. Um, and then the uh, uh, businesses benefit because they get to save or make a lot more money uh, through that corrupt, crooked deal that they made. That's cronyism. You guys got that? All right, cool. Um, take a break and we'll finish after. So that was, those were some of the issues. Uh, along with those working conditions and, you know, not allowing the working class to uh, protect themselves with legislation. But all that we'll talk about next week as to how people think that they can solve these free market issues. The classical liberalism or uh, some form of socialism or Marxism. All right, um, moving on though. All of this economic activity from laissez-faire policies and industrial production drastically reducing the amount of uh, the price of goods and the quantity, increase in the quantity of goods, as well as wealth being generated, uh, greatly increase the uh, wealth uh, of people in the economy in the West. So what are they gonna start not needing money for anymore? Like what are they gonna be able to cover fairly easily? Um, I think it's hard to just live. Yeah, exactly, necessity. So we'll say uh, late 19th century. Society. And this, I got through this marker way, it's good on the way out. All right, uh, so first of all, um, it's much more common in the 19th century in the West to not be so focused and concerned with uh, necessities like food, water, shelter, sort of thing, clothes. Most people have those. Even working class people, as miserable as it is, those things are generally not a huge concern or as much of a concern as they have been in the past. So uh, you've got um, more what you call disposable income. What's disposable mean? I can throw it away? No. No, what's it mean? You can use it on whatever you want to buy. Yeah, on, so I no longer have to, this is like my non-necessity income essentially. So uh, I've used up all I need to for food, shelter, clothes, uh, uh, water, and now I've got some left over, I can spend it on whatever I want. Uh, so some people invest it, save it, some people spend it on things they want in the moment. Uh, nonetheless, people have that option now increasingly in the West. So obviously the uh, upper middle class definitely has this. They've got this by a mile, right? And again, these are the ones you mentioned yesterday, the landowners, the bank owners, the factory owners, the super, super rich. They've got tons of disposable income. But, so they got plenty. They get three money markers here. 
Uh, I also have a growing new class of non-working class people, but they're not wealthy, like super wealthy like this. Uh, they're like a lower middle class. What, what kind of jobs do these people have? And what do they try to do with their disposable income? I didn't list the jobs in the notes. I was just seeing if you guys could think of anything. Think about some people then that, here, so lower middle class, but still middle class. This is kind of what you guys are starting to know as middle class now. So think not manual laborers at work at, at, that are working in factories, but also not like gigantic business bank landowners. Owners. Okay. Individual store owners. Okay. So uh, examples might be shop owners. All right. Okay. What else might I have? Inventors. Inventors. That's not really a profession. Like supervisors. Would you like overseeing? Okay. Managers. Corporate managers. All right. Fair enough. Absolutely. Hold on. Before I forget who's doing this. All right. Who had the first one? Because I already because I already forgot. All right, managers, shop owners, what else might be some examples of? I need an education, or these are more mentally, they're, they're, the requirements are more mentally focused than physically focused, like at a factory or, or manual laboring job. Tutors. Tutors? Teachers. Okay, teachers, we'll say teachers, yeah, there you go. That would be on the lower end of the spectrum, but still certainly above uh, working class. What else? Think higher end uh, knowledge-based jobs. Doctors. Doctors and lawyers, there we go. So these are the kind of people we're talking about. So not mega rich, but certainly wealthier than the middle class or working class. So what becomes their goal then? Oh, I'm gonna give you money for that, by the way. What becomes their goal then? They try to appear more wealthy by buying more. Wealthy. Yeah, they're trying to emulate the upper class and or nobility by appearing more wealthy. Uh, and they can afford it, so technically they are, I guess. But they want you to know that just by looking at them. So they purchase more luxury goods. So give me a couple examples of luxury goods. Like clothes, furniture. Yeah, glasses even were uh, another big one. So clothes, furniture, uh, not just clothes in general, like they all have clothes, but suits, right? Like fancy clothes. Uh, suits, furniture, um, jewelry maybe, right? To show off your wealth, uh, glasses, all examples of uh, what would show somebody is uh, doing well uh, to everybody else just by looking at them. Could they fake this? Yes, they could steal these things or get you know rip off versions of them or, or or whatever. But nonetheless, they sort of show instantaneously where you're at, and that's the whole goal here. Uh, later on, you're gonna have like automobiles and uh, fancier houses and things like that. But uh, this is this is kind of a start. So this this kind of culture, even the, even the working class is able to start getting some of these things by the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, so you've got like uh, there becomes a whole new class economic class, um, working class women, uh, mostly single women, uh, they're an economic group for the first time. So there are certain things that they can market to this group. Uh, what might those be? Oh, yeah, a, a lot of cosmetics. Cosmetics, uh, clothes and whatnot. So females actually become their own economic group for the first time. So I'm not just targeting men or families, I could actually target single women because through working class jobs, uh, like at factories, so they can work at factories, or it could be lower level positions at these places like uh, clerks, secretaries, operators for phones. Those are all examples of, uh, of allowing women, single women uh, particularly uh, at the time, working class women certainly in general, uh, to have their own source of income uh, and uh, be their own economic unit. And that's the first time we've ever had this. Never before have women been able to uh, just go out, earn money, and, and sort of control their own lives. This is a, it doesn't seem spectacular, like, ha, oh, wow, they can go join a factory or, or become a secretary, whoop de doo But like, that wasn't even an option before. It was just, you had to be with your family or uh, married or you were an outcast and couldn't even own property or whatever. But for the first time, they can actually do these things. So this is kind of like, I actually don't know why it's not a part of, uh, like, the, of like first wave feminism or something. Uh, but it certainly should be a part of women's history because this is the first time women can largely control their own destiny. Uh, were they prevented from uh, access to some of these higher up jobs? Uh, certainly, but they still had the option of living their own life if they chose to, which is cool. All right. Um, this quest though for stuff, so I've got my necessities and this quest to enhance the luxurious part of my life, my disposable income, the things that I'm uh, purchasing or doing, what, what, what can we call that sort of cultural motive that 
uh, is often a criticism of, of Western society. Consumerism? Yeah, consumerism, right. This idea that my goal is to uh, get more dis uh, luxurious things uh, is refer referred to as consumerism. And this is a, uh, this is a, this is a positive, uh, uh, positive uh, feedback loop. All right, so the more people that earn money, they go and spend it to buy things. And you guys already know the system. You go out, people, people earn money, they buy things. What do companies have to do? Make, make more. Make more. Raise prices and or make more, right? And then they hire more people. Then it starts that cycle again. So it's just growing and growing and growing this entire time. Um, so as it's growing and growing and growing, uh, it becomes more consumeristic uh, by nature. People are more concerned about better jobs for better things and better lives, et cetera, and, and then showing that too. Uh, and again, this sounds super like shallow and vile now because we're just kind of used to it, but this was the first time this was an option in hi world history where I could actually go out and possibly make my life better uh, and less miserable. So yeah, today it does have a negative connotation, but think about what it actually means. The human condition is you have none of these things. Go find food or die. Like that's essentially uh, what human life has always been. Um, so this is uh, the first time we're able to escape that and start focusing on things we enjoy or things we like. And you can criticize what they enjoy and like here. Fine, fair enough. But it's an option for the first time in world history. And that's why it's uh, such a revolutionary thing. Uh, but it's just second nature to us now. Anyways, because people are so concerned with buying things uh, and spending their disposable income, there becomes a new market uh, for trying to get these customers to come to them. Uh, what is that sort of market referred to as? Okay, yeah, advertising, and that's part of it too. So uh, advertising becomes its own market for the first time. Advertisements, because for the first time ever, people have enough money that you actually are trying to get them to come to you. Like, you know they have the money, and you want them to go to you instead of your competitor across town around the block or whatever. Like, if I go to medieval Europe and I walk around town, there ain't no advertisements. Uh, people are focusing on not dying. Uh, conducting peasant agriculture or doing the things that their guilds tell them to do uh, from the city government. Uh, this is different though. Now you got choice. So for me to get you to come to my store, I got to draw you in with better prices or products or whatever. And that's why we start having the advertising industry. All right. So we have for the first time advertisements. And like you mentioned, department stores. What, what is the uh, benefit of a department store? Well, first of all, what is it? And uh, what's the benefit to it existing or not existing? So you can sell clothes that came from a lot of other different companies, and basically they also, they also advertised their stuff in department stores, and so it was basically a one-stop shop. Okay, yeah, we don't get to like a Walmart, Costco status yet, but yes, it's the start of that process of, I don't just sell baked goods, we have other things too. Uh, so they want you to come to them because it's more convenient. It's like, well, I could just sell shirts, or I could sell shirts and shoes and pants and belts. So now, if I've got to go out and buy these things, do I choose to go to four different stores or do I go to one store? Almost everyone's going to pick one store, right? So department stores uh, become increasingly popular. As It's not quite a one-stop shop, but that's the idea, uh, is uh, more variety uh, equals more customers. And that's just a convenience thing. I'd rather go pay, even if it's a little bit more, uh, for all my stuff in one part than go across town and spend half a day doing something. It's opportunity cost, man. I could be doing something I like or making more money some other way. All right. They're also, for the first time, figuring out how to sell the people who aren't even physically there. What are they doing with that? Um, catalog. How's the catalog work? Basically like magazines showcasing um, products and their prices. And people just like, oh, we'll go to the store now and buy that. Do they have to go to the store? What could they do? If I want the good, maybe I don't have to go to the store. This is, this is getting kind of Amazon-ish, but this does sort of start, yeah, they could, they could potentially deliver it depending on where you are. Uh, so I'm not saying, again, we have Amazon all of a sudden, because we don't. I mean, you guys probably remember 10 years ago, uh, ordering things wasn't that common because it would take forever and cost a bunch of money. Um, so it wasn't super popular, but it was possible. So catalogs would, of course, uh, uh, spread awareness of your store, your company, your products. So they would go to you because they know you have to think that they want or there's a sale or whatever. And potentially, they could uh, maybe deliver it depending on the, situ the circumstance. Uh, and those become immensely popular. A couple examples, even though they don't exist anymore, is uh, Montgomery Ward. Uh, and Sears does still exist, but it's on the way out. 
Uh, now we're being taken over by, as you guys know, things like Amazon and Target and Walmart, places that will give you everything in one spot, or Costco, everything in one spot and or deliver it to you. Um, so yeah, that's the trend now uh, because of uh, globalization. Okay, and that's good enough for uh, the society portion. Now let's talk quickly about population. I think that's the last thing, population and yeah, what they're doing on, with their leisure time. So I do have population increases. Why is my population going up? Because uh, companies are finding more ways to preserve all the food. Yeah, better preservatives, right? Whether it's chemicals or salt or whatever. Uh, what, what's another way that I'm able to make food and keep it for longer or make it go further distances because I can make it last longer? Canned goods. Yeah, canned goods, right. And to keep them cool, what could I transport them in potentially? Yeah, ice cars, right. They don't have to refrigerate yet, but initially they do insulate them and put them, put ice in them and whatnot to, uh, to uh, they figure out that cooling it preserves it, essentially, because it reduces the activity of bacteria that spoil it. Um, so that's, I don't, I don't know if they figured out why yet, but they, they do figure out that um, keeping things cool and or frozen makes them last longer. All right, so population growth. I have, uh, um, not only do I have industrial equipment now for uh, food production and or uh, harvesting, but I have canned goods, which make the food last a lot longer. So I get it cheaper and it can last me through the winter. So I'm more likely to not die because I can't grow something. Um, I can take food further distances. So that increases the amount of food I have uh, in ice boxes. Oh, and all with this, the canned goods preservatives whether it's salt or whatever chemical it might be that makes it last longer. Uh, and also, I'm able to haul large amounts of this stuff cheaply. I can take food all, all the places I want, whether it's across the ocean or, or up the river or across the United States or for, to a different town or state. How am I able to do that? What, what, what new mechanisms are available to me that, that allow me to take these things wherever I want for cheap? And it's important that it's cheap. Like steal those and those. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and these are, of course, on railroads and um, um, steel ships. Much larger cargoes, much cheaper, so every, everything becomes cheaper. Food lasts longer and it's cheaper, so that's gonna increase my population just by default. Even if I make the same amount of food, more of it lasts and people can buy it at a lower price, so my population's gonna increase, and it does. Cool, so people got more money. We got whole new industries, new economic groups, population growth, and people now are increasingly, and it's still continuing by the way, uh, the trend. People worked on average like 60 or so hours a, a week in the 1900s, sorry, the 19th century, and now it's closer to 40. It even dipped a little lower than 40 periodically, now it's dipping above it again. So people got extra time now. Even 60 hours a week is extra time compared to me working six days a week, 12 to 14 hours. If I'm just working 60 hours a week, just working 60 hours a week, I got some time to do other things. What are the other things they start doing with this extra time and extra money? Uh, give me two and then you'll give me two, if you can. Um, they had organized and pro sports. So it was like a sign of high social status and they created like industries for supplies. Yeah, industries for what? Oh, for supplies for the sports? Yeah. Okay, fair enough, yeah. So we actually have professional sports for the first time. So people have enough time to uh, go join these teams. There is enough money so that people pay to watch them so I can now hire coaching staffs and have a professional team. So for the first time ever I have professional sports and you're right, uh, it is a sign of uh, status to go to these games or be on a team and I have a new industry now. Uh, those that produce basketballs or footballs or baseballs or bats or tennis rackets or golf clubs, whatever it might be, uh, it's a whole new industry now that's, that's opened up uh, slash industry. All right, what else am I people doing or uh, uh, going to in the, with their leisure time. You were next. The higher end, the uh, middle class would go to museums. The bid going at the time. Uh, yeah, museums, museums didn't exist before. Why wouldn't they exist before? No one, had no one had the time or money to go to them, right? Now people do, so you can have museums in places like that. Yeah, okay. I wanted two, though. You got museums. What else? Uh, opera houses. Okay, yeah, theater. Fair enough. Museums, uh, theaters, opera houses. We'll just make those the same thing. Uh, yeah, people now have the time and money to uh, uh, pay to go to these things. So now I can have them built. I can have museums built and stocked with things that people will pay to see, uh, or, or singers or orchestras or plays that people will pay to see uh, for the first time on large scale. Cool, so that's a new industry as well, entertainment. Okay, um, what about, I feel like I'm forgetting something. 
Maybe it's not in the notes. Well, maybe it is. Let's see if you got it. Parks. Parks. What about them? Yeah. There are places. That there was a place people could go to with their family and do anything. Yeah, it's actually part of the beautification process because people realize that the industrial landscape isn't particularly pretty. Um, well, the skyscrapers kind of help and the statues later on. But uh, yeah, if it's just a bunch of factories and tenement houses, it's like, that ain't nothing to look at. So uh, they start intentionally making cities more um, aesthetically pleasing. So you start having actual sanitation. So people that are actually paid to go around and pick up garbage, which you know is the garbage man now. Uh, they install sewer systems so that like the waste isn't just laying around. It actually gets funneled out to the rivers, which isn't much better. And eventually they, they start funneling it out into uh, uh, different sources like landfills and things like that. Um, but yeah, we have parks now. So they intentionally set aside territory for like every whatever square mile of buildings you have, you have to have this much, this many acres of parks. So if you ever look at a map on cities, it's no coincidence that the parks are spread pretty evenly around the city because that's the coding. It's like, oh, okay, we do 12 blocks of houses, and now we have to have one block of a uh, of, of park, right? And then the next one that they build, oh, 12 blocks of houses, you gotta have one net park in here. And you'll see that on cities, they're pretty spread out like that. Okay, so parks and beautification. So things would be a lot cleaner. Uh, so we have electric lighting also, so you can do things at night and not be as worried about terrible things happening to you. Uh, and the most important thing is we start actually getting sanitation uh, and sewage. So things are a lot uh, cleaner and more enjoyable. So this is the start of what we now see every day that we have taken for granted. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's starting to become a regular occurrence in the West, and now it's spread slash spreading to East Asia, South Asia. Uh, it's starting to uh, take hold in Africa, in some places, uh, Latin America as well, Eastern and Southern Europe uh, as well. They're, they're catching up or are caught up already, uh, which is wonderful. And there's still some places you go in the world where none of these things exist, and it is miserable to live there. Uh, I won't call any out just because people get all mad on the internet about me calling out certain areas. But uh, there are countries and areas you can go that don't have a stable uh, state system or a, uh, a stable economy or market economy, and they lack all of these things. So it's just a nasty free-for-all of disorganized chaos, and uh, it's not a fun, safe, or sanitary place to be. Any questions about that? So these things are all results of two developments the Industrial Revolution, but also the embracing of uh, free market economies. So you have innovation and you've got the money uh, to produce these things. And then these are things we take for granted and that are criticized for being shallow, but uh, this is the first time in history ever humans have been able to like choose uh, to do these things and have the option of it, which is nice. All right, pack it up. <laughs>